Hibiscus Caribbean Elderly Association is pleased to present the inaugural Lucelle Tate Lecture, an annual lecture named in honour of the first chair of Hibiscus Caribbean Elderly Association and instituted by it as its contribution to the discourse on issues that help shape the black experience in contemporary Britain. The subject of this lecture is Black History Month, its history and relevance to black experience in contemporary Britain. The eminent professor of black studies, Dr. Kahindi Andrews, delivered the inaugural lecture to an audience of Hibiscus Caribbean Elderly Association members and guests at Hibiscus Community Centre on Friday the 26th of October 2018. My role this evening is to introduce you to Dr. Kahinde Andrews, who is going to be talking to us about Black History Month and its relevance um, in contemporary Britain. I just want to just give a little rundown of some of the things because, you know, we didn't just ask anybody to come along and talk to us. Kehinde is the first Professor of Black Studies in the UK. He's also the Director of the Centre for Social and Critical Research, as well as the founder of Black Unity. He does have some books on sale because he's also, you know, a writer, um, comment, commenting on... Um, issues that affect the black community, identity, race and inequality. So the book that he does have, it's a limited number, but it is easy to get hold of, he assures me, is um, Back to Black, Resisting Black Rad Radicalism for the 21st Century. And he's also um, written a book on resisting racism, the race and inequality, and looking at the role of... Um, uh, supplementary schools, black supplementary schools. So I think we've got someone here tonight who's really going to take us to the other side and explore some of the issues that affect us all. So can I welcome you? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for, for coming, actually. I actually spent the first part of my afternoon in the Houses of Parliament, and there couldn't be any more of a different location to talk about this stuff here and talk about this stuff there. In fact, I almost turned down that invitation when I realised who it was from. There's an MP called Alok Sharma, who was the Tory Employment Minister. I heard it this morning talking about Universal credit and defending universal credit. You know, universal credit hurts the most? Black women. Yeah. By no doubt at all. Right? Other person co sponsoring the event was um, an MP called Helen Grant, the vice chairman of the Tory party. And we're going to talk about Windrush. Right? And so sometimes I think that one of the things that we've done as a, as a, as a people, as we're here, we kind of haven't really taken the lessons of history. There are some people who are your friends, and there are some people who are not. Tories are not your friends. <laughs> no, so, and that's why, because I was asked to talk about what's the importance of Black History Month, or Black History more generally, and that's the importance, right? That there's a, a Dinkra symbol of the Sankofa bird, who's looking backwards, but looking forwards. History isn't about just looking back and saying, this happened, that happened, etc., etc. History is about looking back and saying, well, what does that stuff tell us about what's happening now and about where we're going? Right? That's the importance of history, and that's the importance of Black History Month, I guess. Although, we don't really need a month, we need to have Black History mentality. One of the most powerful things to hear today was the list of people who've been involved in this place, because that's a history that doesn't get told at all. So we've been here, but we've been, and I'll get to this in the talk, I mean, we've been part of the Britain for a very, very long time. We've been here in big numbers for well, the last 70 years, right? And that story is almost like nobody's told any of it at all. So my first book was about the black supplementary school movement. It is still the only book about the black supplementary school movement. And that's 50 years of history, right? 50 years, it still carries on a really important uh, social and educational movement that changed the way that the schools run, actually. Right, so schools actually change because of our black supplementary school. And there's only one book about it. In fact, I don't know if there is a book about um, African-Caribbean Health Association. I, 
can't think of one. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I know there is one. And again, you're going to find lots and lots of history, etc. Et so part of what we need to do is have a black history mentality that says, how do we get our stories down? How do we get them told? And one of the also most powerful things about that, that list was how many people aren't with us anymore. And there is a generation that if we don't start writing this stuff down now, it's gone. Like, this is gone. Like, we was woken up. So I think that's really important. One of the things that we're really uh, trying to do at Birmingham City University and why we have Black Studies degree and Black Studies research is to say, actually, it's time to really write this stuff down, get this stuff in the record, uh, get people's voices, because we are in danger, really, and not, I don't overstate this, we are in danger of losing a whole generation of stuff. Because once people have gone, they've gone. When they say when an elder dies, uh, a library dies with them. That is really true for our community, particularly for our community, and particularly for our community here. Um, so black history is really important. Also really important uh, to recognize uh, local people, our people, right? Uh, Lucille Tate, like, really important. That's a really powerful thing to do. So I commend you on doing that, actually. Uh, because again, there's that story that's not told. But also if you take the story of uh, Lucy Tate, you're going to find, looking back, the same Kofa bird, what is that telling us about our story today, right? Why did she come to the UK in the first place? Why was she here? What was she doing? Right. That actually is a really powerful story. It actually tells you loads and loads and loads about what we are doing and what we should be doing and why we shouldn't be consorting with conservatives in the houses of bottom. Right? But it, does, it really does. It really does frame where we are. Right? So think about that. One of the things you think about with uh, migration and one of the differences that often gets played between us in the UK and us in America is that slavery didn't happen in the UK. So in America, you've got a big black population, largely the descendants of the enslaved, in the nation, and that's supposedly different from us here, because people from the Caribbean, obviously we voluntarily migrated. Right? Voluntarily migrated. Can you voluntarily migrate from a place you were taken to in chains? Right? Really? I mean, this is a serious question. Like, like, we, we, why are we in the Caribbean in the first place? We didn't, we didn't go there just to be here. We didn't migrate. There was a process of slavery, which took us there. And then, because of the economic conditions people find themselves in, and still find themselves in, people migrate to the UK. It's not really voluntary. And that's just, you don't really have that much of a choice. Um, so this is really important, because that does tell us a lot about Britain. Right? When we think about black history, black history isn't just about us, isn't just for us, isn't even primarily for us. Uh, what we do think about black history and black studies is that you have to rethink how you think about everything else. So one of the things that really annoys me a lot of the time is there's been this thing about black Britishness. So, you know, you've got, and it's true that we've black, pe black people on the British Isles for hundreds of centuries, thousands, probably thousands of years. Yeah? But we don't need to prove that to prove that we're part of Britain. Because guess what? When Lucy Tate, I don't know that book, but I'm guessing, I 100% guess, when Lucy Tate came from the Caribbean, in the UK, she was migrating from one part of the British Empire to another part of the British Empire. I'm pretty sure her passport said it was a British passport. It just said whichever country where she came from. Like I found my dad's passport, who came in 61, so just before uh, Jamaica was made independent. I put independent in quotes for a reason. Uh, <laughs> and it said, it said it's a British passport, it said Jamaica, right? Jamaica, these islands that we're from, they were part of the British Empire. They were not separate. Places. The Caribbean is the American South. It really is the same, same, same place. In fact, the migration of African Americans from the South, where there was slavery, and they went to the North, where there wasn't slavery, and they thought they were going to be free and liberated, etc., etc., <coughs> is exactly the same process that people, you, well, not many people in the room went through from the Caribbean, where there was slavery, freedom, but there's poverty. So you come to the place where you think it's going to be better, and what do you find? Exactly the same thing in African Americans, family. Right? No better, it's no better in the north and the south. No, really, not really any better in the UK than it is in the Caribbean. Right? So that's a different way of thinking about our problem. Right? Also tells us that we've contributed to this country for a century. Right? Again, why were we taken in the first place? Like, what was the point? They didn't just take us for, for jobs and for a holiday. Right? It took us because they wanted, they needed our labor for uh, slavery, right? Like plantation, cotton, sugar. Key industries that really are the wealth that this nation is built up. Right? I mean, I'm from Birmingham. Birmingham often gets up, gets away with the slavery narrative because we didn't have it's inland, 
you know, there's no, there's no shit, there's not Bristol, it's not Liverpool, it's not even London. It's a huge parts of this city are colleagues of a slave pool. Uh, whereas Britain, Birmingham is inland. Um, and, but think about something like the Industrial Revolution. So we're going to have a celebration of, I think it's James Watt. Uh, James Watt. Because there's three people in Birmingham, James Watt, Matthew Bolton, Joseph Chamberlain. Uh, they all look alike to me, I found them. So we're going to talk about that. It's one of them next year, I'm pretty sure it's James Watt next year. And it's like 200 years or something, a celebration. And the way they teach it, well, I don't know if you learned about this at school, when I learned about this at school, um, it was, People like this, they were geniuses, they worked really hard, they put their money in, they risked everything. There was all these wonderful factors about how great Europe is, etc, etc, etc. And they missed out the key ingredient for all of that industry. So sugar is the first thing that gets processed by the steam engine. Sugar. Where are they growing sugar? That's slavery. What's the second thing that gets processed in the steam engine? Cotton. That's not growing down here, right? Is it? That's slavery, right? So you literally, you shouldn't be able to tell that story without slavery. But that story is told all the time in your schools today, in our universities, I work in universities, with no mention at all of slavery. Right? This is what this is why we need black to a proper black history. The proper black history means that can't happen, right? We have to understand the our role in this, right? And that money is absolutely essential to the wealth, every all the wealth, finance, banking, all these products that actually Britain, what does Britain do better than most places that? Finance capitalism. Where does finance capitalism emerge? Slavery. Right? First is first thing they insured, slave ships. Right? What's the uh, Lloyds of London? Britain's biggest, biggest corporate, massive corporate, huge, huge, huge corporation. Had its 400th celebration every year. I'm not joking, the CEO was on television. She said, We're celebrating our roots in insuring the merchant trade. The trade she was talking about, of course, was the slave trade. Right? She didn't say it, right? So, uh, you know, it's just under siege. So, that's that's our history. Well, that's we have to understand that is our history as well, right? We made literally made Britain when Britain abolished slavery. They gave the biggest payout ever to anything other than war in the history of Britain to that point. And I think actually maybe history of Britain to this point. No, history of Britain until the um, bank bailout of the bank. The only thing that surpassed it was the bailout of the bank. They gave that to pay reparations to the people who were so damaged and so hurt by the emancipation. Black people. Who rich people with it? The slave owners. Right? I mean, the slave owners, that you couldn't even imagine a crazy disease. It gave out reparations to the slave owners. Not only that, you know, slavery was abolished in 84, but not properly abolished until 1834, uh, but not properly abolished in 1838. The reason was because in that reparations bill, it was that we had to continue basically in slavery for four years to pay off part of our own reparations. That's a magic that crazy thing. But it gets worse, right? The money was so big, they had to take a loan from the Bank of England. Biggest loan ever they had to take it off the Bank of England. It took them so long to pay it back. Do you know when they finished paying back this loan? The government finished paying back the loan to the Bank of England. Anybody know? No. No. 2015. <laughs> 2015. Which means that every single person in this room has contributed to paying reparations to slave owners. I mean, imagine that, imagine how crazy that is. You, I know, I know you grew up paying money, paying taxes, and part of that money is done, paying compensation to slave owners. I mean, that's crazy. So it comes out of the tax, is it? Yeah, yeah. that's definitely yeah. that's 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 the tax. That's right, isn't it? 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 So, just think about it. So when people say, when someone says that slavery is, oh, that's all in the past. No, it's not in the past. No, no, it's three years ago. Literally, you're still just paying that debt. And then don't even, and don't even wonder about the fact you haven't got it. You still haven't got your brain. Right? And people actually were harmed by slavery. Our people have seen, haven't seen a penny. You guys have been paying back. The slave owners are yeah, well, you said 2015. That's when we stopped paying. That's when we stopped paying. So what are we paying them for now? But this is what I mean. Well, you pay cash now for your welfare state. You know? When you get to the welfare state, don't worry about it. Okay. Alright, so <laughs> but this is why this is why black history is important, because it's so bad. And the reason we actually know this, because they didn't really tell, nobody really knew this. You know the reason this is that, that we know this that fact, that fact became popular right? was because the uh, Bank of England celebrated. They celebrated, they said this is, they were celebrating, the Bank of England was so instrumental in ending slavery, 
and then we gave this loan to the to the to the to the government, and now you paid it back. They actually celebrated it like it's what it was. This is something to celebrate. They, they, that's crazy. That tells you just how whitewashed our education is. Why Black History must be essential, right? I mean, that's I mean the whole story is uh, crazy. So. And you can track back all that money in slavery, you look at the reparations, where that money went. David Cameron's family benefited hugely, many families benefited, the church benefited, huge, just, just lots and lots and lots of people. Average person in Britain, you what slavery, you could own a share. Remember finance capitalism, the devil's in slavery. You could own a share of one of our ancestors. So actually quite a lot of not rich people had slaves too. They were also not paid. Imagine, so, and then slavery ends, it's not that slavery ends, everything's fine, right? You have apprenticeship, then you have colonialism, and you have growing in poverty, etc., etc. Um, until you have, and, and, and this is really important, is that the, up until 62, right, Jamaica 62, Trinidad 62, and that 60s, 50s, late 50s, 60s, 70s, really important period. Up until that time, they were part, our countries were part of the British Empire, which meant that everything in the country went to the British Empire. I've had a number of old white British people tell me that I should be grateful that they they fought in the war for me, apparently. Um, <laughs> but what they seem to miss out is that there were millions of Africans, Caribbean, Indians who fought in the war, the same war, because we're the same people, right? We're the same place. It was a world war. I have all the black side of my family, as much as the white people of my family, fought for were part of the British war effort. Because that's what you do when you're part of the nation. So again, it's like you don't have to prove you were here, because even if you weren't here, you were still here. Right? And this is where the uh, Lucy Tate example is perfect, is the welfare state. British welfare state, one of the crowning achievements. What was the thing at the Olympics that they said, oh, it's going to be the highlight of the Olympic ceremony? It was the NHS, right? National Health Service. That thing don't exist without Caribbean nurses. It literally never happened. It's still, still today, 24% of the, of the workforce of the NHS is international. Largely in the Caribbean, Asia, um, and Africa. Colonial. That's a colonial work. The reason you were invited, we were invited to come in, was to build the welfare state. Because there wasn't enough people, there were a lot of people that died. Uh, they didn't really come and do that, that labor. And so they, they invited us on. That's neo colonial. That's neo colonial. That's a colonial. It wasn't even neo colonial. At that point, remember, we were still part of the human kingdom. We were still part of Britain. So we were invited to come and do that work. And stayed and did that work. And I think everybody who's Caribbean definitely has a nurse in there. <laughs> because that's what we came to do. To the point where we were talking before, I can't remember the lady's name I was talking to about this. And one of the reasons why the is a dip in a shortfall of nursing is because that generation of nurses are now retired. Because it's that significant. Right? That's your stat, right? Yeah. But that's but that's that's why it's so significant. So yeah, then you have fools like what's his name? Nigel Farage. In the, in that, not this election, the last one, talking about it's the National Health Service, it's not the International Health Service. What are you talking about? The whole, the, there is those, those <coughs> the National Health Service. The National Health Service in the United Kingdom depends entirely, 100% of foreign workers. In fact, it's one of the worst features of the National Health Service because we actually drain resources from other countries. So at the peak of the Ebola crisis, 24% of the nurses and 15% of the doctors from Sierra Leone we had Ebola, we probably could have done with those people who were working in the NHS. Right? So we basically we get we get poor countries to train doctors and nurses and then take them into the NHS and they work and do all that and do that and make it cheaper for us. Right? So let's think about those things. So one of the things you think about black, that's when I talk about black history, black history actually changes how we think about just general history. Right? This is really is transforming how we start to think about all of these debates about the health service, etc. etc. The welfare state. Um, the idea that that's somehow this wonderful achievement of Great Britain. Nonsense, nonsense. I mean, actual nonsense. I mean, did you watch the document? I don't know if you saw the film Spirit of 45 by Ken Lodge. Anybody watch it? Don't watch it. Really don't watch it. I mean, it's just this white version of the welfare state. We're all these white working classes, win the welfare state, and there's literally no black or brown people in the whole thing. Right? That's what we need. Um, that's definitely what we need for that history. And again, thinking, looking back and thinking now, this would. If we had a proper perspective of black history, then the Windrush scandal simply couldn't happen. I mean, it literally couldn't happen. You're talking about people who were born, largely people who were born in Britain, right? Or born in a period where British nationality was still 
nationality wasn't given to you, you had the right to stay here. Very clearly, legal right, not complicated at all. You have the moral right to be here, obviously, because the Caribbean is part of the, um, part of the country, etc., etc. But what happened to it? You found hostile environment, you can't prove it, now you're not a citizen. Now you're not, you don't have the right. Yeah. And people are losing their jobs, people are getting deported, and this has been going on for a long time. Right? Actually, one of the worst features of this whole thing is that what it took for us to start talking about it was one, the Windrush celebration. So because Windrush was coming up, um, people were starting to gear up for celebrations. I think it was the Guardian newspaper started hearing these stories, and then they popularized it, and then we got mad. This has been happening, this has been happening since 2010. This isn't happening for continuously. This is not a new thing. This is pop up around window celebration. We actually wait for the white media to tell us there was a problem in our own community. We should also tell us there's, there's something wrong with us. Right? But importantly, you can't have windrush if you have a proper idea of bridge. Right? But what am I'm saying that, but I don't actually agree. In fact, I'm saying that, but I don't agree. Because maybe I'll wait for you to finish on the phone. <laughs> but um, no, so I'm saying that. See, it's what I'm saying because on one hand, like, look, all the evidence here is clear. Everybody in the room, everybody part of it, we have a very clear link to British. You know, we, we are owed something. There's a debt to be paid. We're part of it. We built the nation, etc., etc. <coughs> That's one historical. Way of looking. But the other thing, when you look at history, is what is your historical relationship to the country? And I don't want to overplay this because people talk a lot about the Windrush generation came over as citizens. It's actually not technically true. Uh, the Windrush generation came over as subjects, colonial subjects. And there's always been a difference between a colonial subject and a colonial citizen. Even though they may have called them citizens, they were not, we were not citizens, we were subjects. Right? And that's hugely important because that's hugely different. Because your status as a subject can be changed. Right? In fact, one of the reasons why I, quote, I quoted uh, independence, thinking about our history, is you have to ask, why did we get independence in the first place? Remember, so 48, you need people to work, people start coming over, even Enoch Powell, racist that he was, was one of the people that wanted people to come over. Look, we need people, like, we got people to bring them over. But they never anticipated that we'd stay in the country. The plan was not for us to stay, it was come, work, and get out. When we started staying, right, back in the 60s, the kids started coming in, that's when they started saying, oh, oh, hold on a second, this, this is not what we agree. Right? That was not the plan. And this is when you see the argument for what? Independence. Because remember, if you've got, if you're, it's a Caribbean, an Indian, Africa, a part of the United Kingdom, you really cannot stop people moving. What, what's your legal right to stop people moving? Only way you can stop people moving is to say, well, look, now you're not part of the United Kingdom, it's an independent country. And because you're an independent country, you can, we can vote for it. So it's no coincidence in the act, the 1962 Commonwealth Immigration Act, that, that makes a big difference between people in the old Commonwealth and these independent countries and people in the UK and migration laws is exactly the same reason. When did Jamaica get independent? 1966. This is not a coincidence. They passed the law the same year they made Jamaica and Trinidad independent. Because the whole point of that law was simply to keep it back, to keep it back. And if you look at British migrate, immigration policy since then, it's made it far every single effort to make it more and more and more and more and more and more difficult to come. So the Windrush scandal, I don't know why, you, why would you possibly be surprised? That's, what's been, that's been coming for a long time. There's the logic of the system. Labour, Tory, the way we was in that. That's the logic of it. So I think so, and I think that's also important for us then, because what, we shouldn't be shocked when these things happen. We are subjects, not citizens. And I you list off a whole load of steps about people who are born in the country. I was born in the country. What does that mean? My children are born in the country. What does that mean? It means that in Birmingham, parts of Birmingham, 50% unemployment for young black men. That's definitely parts of Birmingham. You got Tottenham, unemployment rates, third world unemployment. You look at healthcare, you look at mental health, you look at poverty, you look at anything, right? This, this should tell you that actually your historical relationship to this country is that you are a subject, not a citizen. And we should stop being surprised 50 years, 60 years later, since we've been here, that we're not getting treated the same as we should. Right? I mean, listen, I was born here, my mom was born here, and my children were born here. <coughs> and I can say that we should get equal treatment, but that would be crazy given our historical relationship to the United Kingdom. We're still black, because that still means you're still in the world. Right? Even if I may have a slap up a pressure sheet, it doesn't mean I'm elevated above blackness, believe me, every day. 
someone or someone something happens to remind you of it. So why is that important? I don't want it to go negative, 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 negative. Uh, it's important because I always start negative. Always, always start negative. Because. It's the truth. Yeah. But start negative and get positive, right? Because why is it important to know your historical relationship? Because then it says what did you do then, right? Which is where you go. Alright? Now we can keep on pretending that we can have equality and so fine and we just get on and we pass the laws and we <laughs> sit down with Tory and be so against the Tory and Phoenix and it's been made about three days that Tory and Phoenix. But we can keep pretending that's the way forward. Or we can look for alternatives, right? And this is a game where history is really important because there are historical alternatives, massive historical alternatives. Does anybody know the biggest black organization that ever existed? Biggest black institution? Hmm? Universal. Big, yeah, Universal. Universal Negro Improvement Association, Garvey Movement, 50 odd countries across with 5 million members 100 years ago. Imagine it, 50 odd countries, no internet, no phone, no Facebook, no that. No smartphone. Managed to build an organization with 5 million members uh, 100 years ago. That's a mass movement. Something that we've never got anywhere near replicating at this moment. And uh, people always often ask, why was the Garvey movement so successful in being able to do that? And the big reason is because when the Garveyites went around the Caribbean, went around America, went around uh, Latin America, and they were talking about, look man, this, this, this place ain't really for you. This, this is the reason for us. We're going to build something else. Everybody got it. They understood. They were like, okay, it's obvious. Because racism was so severe at that point, you all understood, right? But what's happened in the last 50 years? The last 50 years, you've got independence. Okay? You've got government, you think things are getting better. You've got the Race Relations Act, 65, right? Subsequently, right? I mean, Britain has the best race relations laws in the whole UK, right? Apparently, the government and all institutions have to do an equality impact assessment before they make any major decision. I say apparently, because no one ever does it, and there's nothing to happen. Right? I mean, ever do that, I just don't ever do that. Like, Probably seen the city people who have jobs. Well, no, you right. know, I go out every day, I see the numbers growing. So, you know. Yeah, again, but I said, don't be tricked by your bias sometimes. What's the numbers growing? There's one person and there's five people. The numbers grew. Uh, and but it ain't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I work for, you know, I see the, you know, we had uh, the financial, chief financial officer mm -hmm. was a black man. Yeah, yeah, but that's um, it. Well, okay, so we can. And, and that was one, but it's not only that, but they're getting into more and more senior positions in companies. Yeah, so. More and more successful, but that's not being acknowledged. Yeah, but the perfect, the perfect place to look at is America, right? So America has a big black middle class. Right? America has a big black middle class and a black president. You can find black CEO. But what's the conditions like for most black men? Terrible. They're actually worse than that. So I think, that, look, you can say that things that there's, there's a class you want to acknowledge, and fair enough, but that does not, that is not, and I promise you 100%, that is not how most black men are. That is not. And not all black men, that is not. And what, we, and what we often, what we can do is we can kind of say, oh, look, this is, this is the progress. But like I said, look at America, big black middle class. It's far worse than that. We have to look at the average, not the exception. Uh, and unfortunately, at this point, that's the exception. But I think if you can get the 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 you can you can get the you can get the you can get the you can get you can get the you can get the you can get the you can get the you can there is no way that's going to get solved in the middle. I'm not saying there's no hope at all. No, 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 no. I'm going to say that we have different things and we can't rely on the system to give it to us because that's never going down. That's my point. In society, uh, to change it, you've got to be in there. Why? Yeah? Why? Because you cannot stay outside and change it. You've got to be in, you've got to go inside and to, um, to help put your views on work, and I try and change society. Uh, no, I mean, so, okay, that's, that, that, that is an argument. I was saying, I, I don't think, I don't agree, and you can make the argument. But I think, you look at how most changes happen, it's in groups who aren't in the I mean, even let's look at, on a basic level, how do you get reforms of the police in the United Kingdom? 
He's not. He's not actually all this stuff about. Um, he's not. He's not asking people. He's not voting. He's not that. He was right. It was eighty-one. You have a reform. Eighty-five. You have a reform. You have reforms in the nineties because people were outside the system said, "Yeah, hey, okay, things going on." Right. So I think actually, like one of the things you tend to find is that people, when they get into the system, systems change people. People don't change them. Unfortunately, not hundred percent. Like ninety-five percent. Right. So actually, this outside, this getting pressure on the outside, pushes the inside to change things. Okay, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not saying don't be in it. I'm in it. I can't say that. I'm in it. I'm probably in it. So, but you have to have stuff outside as well to push it. Of course. Sorry, sir. Again, the same sort of issues I have from a political point of view. You mentioned the Conservatives. But what you're suggesting is we circumnavigate them totally. Because, again, I'm thinking perhaps if we had someone say to Mr. Cameron, this ain't the way to go. Looking like me, perhaps you might listen. <laughs> perhaps. I doubt it. Well, if, if, there's, no, if, if, if there's a way to, if I've encountered the Jack Straws in the Labour, the Camerons in the. Is there a party perhaps or. You know, no, this is what I'm saying with power. Like, we had. Well, sometimes you give far too much to one person. So one person is the thing you do. Actually, you know, if you had an organisation in Britain that had a million black people that was then well resourced, and they could say, if you don't do this, there will be a boycott of you. They will listen to you. Right? But even if you want to change the system, that's how you change the system. Right? How is it that the, the Jews have got the power? They're so good. Because they organized well, what you guys said. How is it Asians have power in the They organize. Just organize. That's it. That's the solution. How do you wrap up our change sadly with these people who are so sad and release these guys who have been stopped by the police? Uh, you know, numerous time, and they haven't um, committed an offence, but they've been stopped because they drive a car, they drive a good car, they drive a big car. Again, how, do you, how, do you, how do you take that? Again, like I said, if you had, let's just say, let's take, no, let's take this area. If you had a proper black organisation, well resourced, they would go to the police and say, no, this is going to stop it, something's going to change. That would stop it overnight. Right, we just, we always, well, our problem is we're always looking for moral arguments. Like, stop doing things that are wrong. We've been on the right side of the argument for 500 years. That's not the answer. The answer is power, and the only way you get power is your organization. Just let's read it. So, what's up then about our youngsters then? Why are they killing each other? 50%. <laughs> 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 they you on your own. They can get your like, like, the conditions they are in, they fall into stuff that just, you shouldn't be into. But, like, it's not great, you know? I'm a real one. Some children put up the boat. Yeah, but people say what child that they die. And then you want to have a free black boy. I'm 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 more or less going to have an even though I'm going to be a zero. Then there's more lightning in the bed. My point is that the answer is that we have failed them as a community. Not the parents, not the kids, not the music. We have failed them as a community. Because we haven't provided them opportunities to do anything other than that. All they have is no can't get a job, can't get police, so we haven't given anything other than harsh words. So what do you say for a couple then? They got two kids, right? And they're both working, and the kids gotta defend for themselves. What do you say for that? They try to pick them now. I'm saying, but you shouldn't be talking to them, you should be talking to us. Why does the kid have to defend for themselves? Why have we failed to put someone in place where they keep dying to defend themselves? Because the government is taking the government. Okay, the work. Okay, the Why because that's the really where they can survive. Why can't this be? Why can't we? Yeah. Well, what, what are we doing? What are we looking around for? Yeah. <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah. You've used the term equality a number of times in your talk. And we also have a statutory organization called Racial Equality Council or Commission, something like that. Have you ever come across a clear definition? For the term racial equality? Yeah, I, I said I use the term equality, it's not a term I actually use generally because of that reason. What's equality? The, quality, the equal chance to be poor as a white person? I mean, that's what you're talking about, right? What is equality? Like, there's different ways of equality equality of opportunity. So, like, you know, you don't change anything that's wrong, you just say, look, you can, have, you can equally have a chance to get this very low paid job. Or there's equality of outcome, where it's actually maybe everybody should kind of have the same kind of. Stuff and there shouldn't be this massive gap between which are both. So actually, I generally don't use the term equality. I don't think what we should be fighting for is equality. What we should be fighting for is freedom. 
Freedom is a very different thing yeah. than equality. Would you like a racial equality commission as a definition for the term? I don't even think they, they mobilize the words. Effectively, equality typically means equality of opportunity. Equal opportunity. Do you have the same opportunity to get the same as somebody else? And then there goes our problem because what we are striving for is the equality of the current department. Again, we should stop talking about equality and stop talking about can I, can I, um, I want to thank you again for being here. And I uh, want to say to you how much I missed you at all when he died. And um, thought that there would never be anybody else on the horizon until I saw you, Ash Saka, Afua, and Akala. And now I'm feeling a lot better than I did when Stuart Hall died. I saw the problem that you had with people like Tony, um, Trevor Phillips and um, Tony Sewell. And I want to tell you how much my heart goes out to you and um, applaud you for the way in which you handled that situation. Now, tonight, I thought that what you said or what you did or what the presentation that you made, I welcome that. I want, to, I want you to know how much I appreciate you and I would like you to pass on to Ash, Afua, and Akala, that they've got, they've got um, support in the community somewhere. Now, if we talk about, I hear you talking about getting people to vote and all of that kind of stuff. And I know a lot of our people don't believe in voting because they've been um, fed with the idea that they shouldn't vote because it wouldn't make a difference. And we don't, we, we're in serious trouble because of that. We need to find a way out of that, that we, our people need to know that they matter and they can make a difference. But if they just stay at home and think that they don't matter and they're not voting, they don't know who to vote for. Like, for example, in the Brexit thing, if you watch Question Time, if you watch the Today program, if you watch anything, Newsnight, there's never been a black pair of people there talking about how it's going to affect us. And that's what I'm saying. We need more people, and wherever you go, and wherever, whoever you could talk to, and whoever you could influence, we need to tell them that we need more of you out there talking about our interest in Brexit and our interest in where we go forward. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, no, so thank you. That, that's really nice to hear. Um, what I would also say though is, we don't need more of me, we need more of us, right? And if the principal thing we need is all of us to be fired, is all of us to be building this, this work. And look, I, I'm one of those people that's a bit, a bit no, I, I'd say you have to vote and that vote is important. But one of the reasons that young people don't vote is I think they understand that our de democracy is a bit of a sham, right? It really is a bit of a sham. Yeah. Uh, if you're, I mean, you know how many seats, how many seats for parliament there are that are majority minority? In the UK, and we'll see where the majority of voters are non white. You know how many seats there are? It is one. Now, let's think about London. Go around London and think about the areas where they just don't want people. In Birmingham, there's loads of areas, right? Well, so there's one seat in the whole country that is majority because the way it's drawn is so gerrymandered so that you're always stuck in a, in, a, with, a, with, as in the minority. So, there are serious limitations to voting as well. But I would always say vote, you definitely vote, I mean, especially with these, these devils in the country we got right now. You definitely vote. But, but what I would say is to get young people on board, it can't just be about voting. Because they, they just don't, they just, they're not. So that's about a bigger project that includes voting, but also includes solving their problems. Because they know that voting probably won't solve their problems. Right? So it has to be about a bigger project. I hundred percent agree. It's about getting as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Lorna Jackson. I'm the head teacher of the local school, Maryland School down the road. And I listened to a comment just now about you know, what's happening to our children from that corner of the room. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say, I think that there needs to be more teaching on resilience, respect, and ambition, not just to the children, but to their parents, to the young parents that I see come into my school who do not have those values. We were all brought up, everyone in this room, I'm sure was brought up with manners, you know how to speak to people, you respect 
uh, your elders. That's right. you, um, I'm afraid it's not just the youngsters, the little ones, it's their young parents that need those lessons. Mm. And therefore, they would know where their children are at 10 o'clock at night. I've got parents at school who don't know where their 10-year-olds are 10 o'clock at night. So, and I am actually referring to, the, to my, you know, the, my own community. Um, my son is out from school, he comes stays in Well, you say, you, you've got those values, but, but, but you cannot assume, that's fantastic, you cannot assume that, that the next generation have that. Um, the second thing I'd like to say is, that um, thank you for giving me a new perspective on what Black History is, and that's what we should be teaching, not Black History Month. Now, I hit the news several years ago because I said I did not believe in Black History Month, and I got a lot of criticism from black people. I said I did not want history shoehorned into the month of October. We teach it all year round at Maryland School. It is part of our So when people hear black history, they think about the month. They don't think about the delivery that I've just heard. So thank you very much. Black History Month is currently promoted by the state, in your view, in the interest of the black community, and if no, what should we be doing? Of course not. I mean, of course not. No, it's not a choice. It's a token suggestion. It puts everything into one more. Can I, can I we should be organising. Oh, we should be organising the rest of the year. Sorry. Right? Black History Month celebrates. What we do is we educate. That's the difference. Yeah, I mean, no, we have to be doing this year, 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 year round, not just talking this congestion at all. And I think, to be honest, we should, we should probably stop accepting the money and say, let's just start using this money across. This is pretty heavy, this is pretty heavy. This is a very Excuse serious. me. I just want to say it's a good thing that this is South here, because back in the Caribbean, we didn't learn anything about black history. We learned English history. We learned all other history apart from black history. So this really is a new beginning, and it's good for the kids. But as um, the teacher says, it should be integrated. It should be in the program. It should be in the So it's only about heroes. It's nothing at all to do with what this gentleman is teaching us. They only teach about, the, you know, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, all the M's. What this gentleman is teaching is something about ourselves here. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and I think, you know, I'm gonna, I actually have to get directly. I, I really have question. to leave, I probably have to leave it a bit. So I'm going to end by just by saying, actually, this lady. Because you're an educator. Well, you think you've got the influence of Just one more. Don't be too much for not telling me. Just one more. Just one more. Just one more.